Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John, and welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies, both new and old, with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid lazy negativity, we've decided to make this episode a drinking game. Fuck yeah, we did. So anytime you hear us say anything negative at all about each other, about this film, about your mom, we're going to play this sound. (laughs) And that sound means that we're taking a drink and we hope you drink along with us. So pour yourselves a glass. We go back in time before insulation when there were no secrets in the house. (laughs) Yeah. Definite note from me. (laughs) <laughs> did they not know that if they just said anything everybody would hear them yeah it's traumatize the 80s, dude. this child this it just every single thing how did they make love it was just okay yeah um yeah the kids in the room la 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 that's it was the only defense you had no kid did that every speaking from experience was Dave, are you bringing yeah. up some childhood trauma boys oh there was there was some definitely some trauma in this one it's, it's like <laughs> Oh my god! But he, he drops that kid off by himself at the bank. I'm like, it's all right. That oh, little yeah. motherfucker's Gen X, man. They do that shit to us all the time. Uh huh. <laughs> Honestly, dude. <laughs> oh Honestly. my god, you're 100 percent right. Or or he leaves him at the bar. Yeah. Or he walks out of the bar. the bar. I was yeah. like, I had crazy hard written all over that. Um, people, that's our teaser for what we're going to be talking about today, which is of course Paris, Texas, the Vim Vendors film, which won the Palme d'Or in 1984. Why are we talking about this movie? Because the random year generator spun the year 1984. John was unfortunately not able to be with us last week, so our buddy Matt... Shit. <laughs> <laughs> you almost did it again. Oh, that's so good. Oh, my God, Matt. I'm so sorry. Mark. 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 Well, I was going to say the Matt Mark. Mark. Anyway, it all just jumbled in my head. Anyway, we, we the three of us decided... We should do this movie. 1984 is an unbelievable film year. Yes, so it is. So we are going to set it up. We're going to give you the context of what else was happening in films, highlight some other films that we've already talked about in previous episodes and some other ones that we considered for this episode before getting to our featured segment, which is, of course, a, long, a longer discussion of Paris, Texas. And boys, I think we're clairvoyant. I think we are just on to something because last week we picked a movie about aliens invading Earth Essentially, when we did <laughs> um, Invasion, of the, body Invasion of the Body Snatchers <laughs> from 1956, right after we chose this movie, there was an earthquake on the East Coast, which just happened to be right before an eclipse, which we literally dumped the episode on the eclipse. Then we decided, out of all the movies of 1984, to do Paris, Texas, and our second most mentioned podcast on this show. <laughs> is the Team Deacons podcast and of all fucking guests in the film world that they could have had on this week, they put Vim Vendors, the director so cool. of this movie, who I, I'm so sorry to say I literally had never heard of before last week. And then as soon as we chose this movie, he is interviewed in one of our favorite podcasts. What we're Whatever we choose next week has a high bar to clear for us selecting movies. <laughs> Unbelievable, yeah. right? Yeah. God, I hope all those things aren't omens for what could be a terrible year November? coming up. And, yeah, honestly, <laughs> honestly, not to jump the gun here, but I saw Civil War this week, so I'm excited. I was hoping to talk about you, that. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna give us you're gonna give us a mini you're gonna give us I a mini will, review. I, I will give you. I've got two too many reviews for you. Two mini reviews. Yeah, John, we missed you for a week, and now you're back rapid fire in the mini reviews. Glad you're back. Glad you're well. Um, we also are gonna finish up the episode with what we've been watching, so we can give you a tease of that. Get through some gripes as well. So if you need to get to 1984 if you need to hear your paris texas content check the show notes we have a timestamp. scoot ahead to get to our conversation but this is a drinking show trust me so i was, I was there and nobody needs to get to 1984 uh, also i'll just say one more thing off the bat it's really annoying when you're looking up like 1984 movies because there's a fucking book named 1984 which is very yeah. famous which was made into at least one movie and, and so an it's like Roger Deakins it's, shot <laughs> that Roger yeah so it's like no that's that's definitely not what I mean God, fuck you know what I mean everything's connected dude oh no <laughs> anyway that's my only grip about that so if you need to get to your Paris Texas conversation Scoot ahead a couple minutes but we gotta get loose we gotta get drinking so we got the mini reviews we've got some gripes dude jo- my hands are huge <laughs> John, John's going to shout out our sponsors and one of our sponsors has decided to join our brother podcast, the Matt and Mark movie show this week as a guest. Can't wait to check that out. John, you want to shout our sponsors yeah, out to get us going? I did hear about that. I will. We have a beer maker in, in, uh, 
in our friend group who so kindly decided to be our beer sponsor. He's provided some delicious brews for two mm. out of three of us more regularly than he has for me. But he I did not ship Mr. them to California. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> we keep, we keep telling you, that's, that's traffic. It's like, not you, you know, like across state lines with alcohol. <laughs> I know. Carlos. People, people Moroso, have never done that before. Motherfuckers. Yeah. You can find him on the Instagram, link in our show notes, all the usual stuff. Uh, beer. Like him, love him, follow all that stuff. We also have uh, an artist in residence who provides every piece of music you have ever heard at the beginning, middle, or end of these episodes. That yeah. man's name is Dasein. D-A-S-E-I-N. Can, can we call him artist in residence? Because he's in some other bitch's house tonight. Okay, I it's know. a, it's so a saying, to Dave. Mad Marks. <laughs> Mad Mark, he's coming on if you want to hear him. He's been on our he's show. He's out there to promote twice, our show. But... He's out there promoting our show. <laughs> yeah, Brandon. Yeah, come on, hit us up. I mean, excuse me, Dawson, hit us up. Yeah, tell him yeah, about excuse the. Excuse me. Do come they on. do that? Guys, do they do they do Mad Mark? I love you. I'm sorry I don't listen to you guys enough to know if this is something they you know. do consistently. <laughs> I know they know. Every the other I get Mad Mark, if you're listening to this, I hear more of your show through the voicemails and the in the the clips that Dave plays on our show. You're usually kind to me and mean to Dave and Jeff, so I, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> do they mention our show the way we mention their show? Sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Mm. Good. Because I feel like I feel like we uh, we came up together in the ranks of pandemic movie podcasts. That's right. So it's nice to scratch those backs. My brother is a huge <laughs> fan of their show, so he will be on there uh, this week. Yeah. Check out Brandon, aka Dasein. He recommends movies to them all the time, and they just fucking shit all over the recommendations. Of course they did. They're every, so like funny. every single time he recommends a movie, they fucking hate it, dude. So I'm kind of no. curious what he's going on for this week. I can't remember what movie he's discussing, but we reunited anyway, in our Mark hatred of show. Argyle. They, somebody saw Argyle and they knew that I hated it because they listened to our show, and so we just. Why'd you guys went... see Argyle? Why'd you do that? Well, they saw, I already saw it. I'm never seeing that again. That's for fucking sure. But they, I forget, Matt had maybe already seen it and then Mark hadn't seen it. And so like every time somebody sees it, you just need to talk to somebody about how stupid this movie is for $200 million. And so that's what we did. Okay. Oh, that's so good. Mad Mark, just so your feelings aren't hurt. I don't listen to my show either. So, um, you know. That's, yes, that's, that's true. That's that that is true. true. Fucking true I've, story. Dude, I have listened I've, to your, your podcast more than I've listened to ours. <laughs> so, you're going to be a college graduate soon, though, John, <laughs> for the second time, which is great. Oh, some of the, some of the, like, everyone enjoys the extra clips we put in when we just rag on John. So. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a whole <laughs> world of you guys just fucking trolling the hell out of me, and I have no idea. All right, let's get back is it to the fun sh- that I don't know. This show's get- long no. enough. We're good. No, we're, we're just right. happy. Take we're just happy when you don't ask us to cut anything out that you say, and we're like, "Did you? Yeah. Um, Do you so- even care? Do you listen? <laughs> Have you considered not saying it? <laughs> no. 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 Yeah, you got to speak your mind. That. Better to ask forgiveness than permission. I don't know what um, that means, Dave. Well, John, better the, the, to the text are- Dave at six a.m. <laughs> I'm going to put it in the episode title. Yeah, Jack Dave. That's what exactly what he wants to do at 6 a.m. is listen to John's voice again to edit it out. I'm um, usually up working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 3 a.m. your time. Yeah. Um, hey, yeah. do you... What's your other mini review? It's going to be in the episode title. Monkey Man. Know. You fucking... Uh, oh, my God. Damn it. I swear yeah. in two weeks I'm going to be seeing a lot of movies. I swear on my life. I was... All I saw was yeah. Masters. This I was okay. trying to get to Civil War, but it just didn't, didn't happen for me this week. Sure. One out of three hosts of this show loves movies. That is, uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the takeaway from this conversation. We saw a movie a week in theaters all of last year. I know, honestly, you guys, I hadn't gone John, to. Drink. I was literally like looking at my A-list account, and I was a little ashamed. I was like, dude, I haven't seen a movie in the movie theater in like a month because yeah, I love yeah. doing this random year generator. But we're watching a lot of stuff at home now, and there was like a lull there where I didn't need to go to the movie theater. There wasn't something I was dying for. I was so, very excited to see both of these, so I'm excited you know, to talk about it. Donating to AMC, keeping the share price yeah. afloat. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. They are, they are now the planet fitness of movies. Guys, we are fucking r- money in their, our hands are in their pockets. The A-list is incredible. I can't believe people yeah. don't get it more often. It's unbelievable. The deal is incredible. Nobody even paid us to say money that. We're saving. I know. And you can actually wait in the but A-list line, and it takes longer than the regular line. It's amazing. The perks How many get. clips are there of our show? If AMC wanted to, they could find a plethora of clips of Dave destroying them with their with their local uh, theater reviews. Yes. But also all of us just like relishing our A-list memberships and talking about how great it is to see these movies in all these formats. It's just unbelievable. Knowing Alec, so, the ones they find man, the me- when I destroy Times Square. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you probably would be doing the world a favor if that theater got <laughs> brought down to the ground and rebuilt again. I saw Monkey Man in Prime. I think I've only seen one other movie in AMC Prime. It was fantastic. Ah. Atmos sound, recliners. It was great. Good picture. Prime. It's a good, Prime. It's a good we, format. Prime, when we can't think of anything else to charge it extra for. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck are they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even matter to us. It doesn't yeah. even matter. It's just a big screen anyway, and recliner I'm seats. Sorry. Damn, Atmos, think, though, it has no, Atmos. Not in, not in Prime. Yeah, it does, dude. No, nah, it's not Dolby Atmos. It has Atmos. There's four, 13 speakers. I saw I counted. Yeah, Atmos is 27. On each side. There's okay, that okay, cool. And then the behind the screen. I was but, no, I was thinking about it. I think it's fake Jeff, Atmos. how frustrated are you that we're not moving forward with the episode? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. It's usually me. I'm actually relieved. Because <laughs> as soon as we get to 1984, I'm going off the rails. A lot of shit happening. I'm going to be yapping. <laughs> Can we get there right now? I have been waiting. I didn't get to learn no, about, about the year 1950. What about oh, you the want me to do those first? Yeah. Do you want to wait? Till him him that's what we do. Yeah, no, go no, ahead. I'm going to hit them up. Go ahead. Uh, congratulations to both of these films. They're worth uh, going uh, to the fucking movie theater to see, dude. They are. I enjoyed both of them so much. Monkey Man is Dev Patel's directorial debut. I ran into him several times while he was doing post-production sound because the place I worked at did that. And he seemed stressed every time I saw him. I saw him once at CAA. He seemed stressed there. And you know what? It was worth it, Dev Patel. You made a fucking sweet yeah. they revenge beat all those tale, guys dude. Up. Really cool, you guys. He's not a superhero from the jump. I'm not going to give away too much info here. But there's a whole lot of uh, Indian lore that goes into it which i have no idea is real or not it doesn't matter for a western audience there's there it's it's uh put there for you to hold on to if you want it i don't know if it's true or not. i don't know if it actually exists in their uh, religion or their stories or mythology but it's planted but he is not that from the jump he's just a man and it was a, so it's not john wick in india which i think a, a very reductive mm -hmm. A review could say that because it has those all of those is classic it, revenge elements. Is it the crow in India? Well, less because cool. he's Good. sort of a nobody Good. that is a fighter, but not the ultimate superhero fighter. He's fighting for the wrong reasons. And anyway, it turns into um, to something that you think it's going to be, but the deliverance of that is so satisfying, and the cinematography is so bold and not experimental. Not experimental, but um, let me say this. He's taken some roots from his very first film. A lot of handheld, really intense close-ups like Slumdog Millionaire. Like, honestly, these movies he's been in, you can see the influence they've had on him. And I thought he really pulled it off. Music's great. Sounds good. Fucking amazing fight choreography. Taking place what seemed to be in a lot of really rich locations. Maybe in India, maybe not, but it felt real. Two thumbs up. I, I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, and I'm really glad I went to the movie theater to see it. And Civil War is just another check mark for Alex Garland. He has never missed. This movie is, it's, it does what, I, I want to give my, my biggest thumbs up to him for not relying on gigantic, uh, and I love World War Z, but it's kind of, I kind of kept thinking about World War Z when I was watching it. All these like maybe gigantic wide shots where you see an entire city like at war or something like mm. that. He doesn't really rely on. There's plenty of CG in this movie. Don't get me wrong, but the cinematography is much more subjective. So there's a there's an experience that you go through with Kirsten Dunst and and the rest of the team that feels very personal. And I don't really know how to say it. It feels almost not not documentary style. It's way mm. more refined than that. There's a lot of handheld, but there's a there's a maturity and a refinement and aesthetic to the way that's, it's told in the cinematography that Alex Garland always has. That's a that's it's a really beautiful. Good, is it is it kind of like um, I was at Cloverfield where like all this shit is happening around them, but it keeps on them. So you know that's it's a really out there. good comparison. Except it doesn't have any of that kind of visceral, shaky feeling. The oh whole no, no, time. no. So the, yeah, none of the camera yeah, work. I'm talking about yeah. the the like the way they structure the scenes is like uh, this shit is going on all over the place, but <laughs> we're only getting what's what they're experiencing. Almost, almost, because he does a really good job of keeping the politics of how we arrived at this point a little ambiguous. It's not yep. totally ambiguous. You get an idea, but it's a little ambiguous. And there are some news and information that's coming in from the radio and stuff so that 
you feel like you can get a little bit of a glimpse outside of just their POV. Yeah. So if Cloverfield is uh, on this side, and I don't know what would be on the other side, like a World War Z or like a you know Armageddon or a Deep Armageddon. Impact, you know, on this side, you know, that really has an objective eye. I would say it's closer to Cloverfield, but not all the way over there. So you get this. There's enough levity for you to be able, not levity. There's enough uh, distance from you for you to be able to tolerate it. But one of the most amazing things I just want to, this last thing I'll say, I promise, because I really just want people to go watch it. I don't want to tell you anything about the story um, other than its subjectivity. I, I saw it in IMAX and IMAX is a loud movie theater. Everybody knows that. But the mixing they did on the sound for when you are a part of their photography, war photography group moving through a war scene, an urban war scene is overwhelming. It's very intense and very loud. And yet it's a, it's a testament to him being able to do something like that that didn't just feel like it was shock value because so much is happening to characters throughout. It's just, he is a fucking brilliant filmmaker too. Mm. Go watch it. Go mm. watch it, folks. Please, please, please see it in the movie theater. I think you would lose something if you watch it at home. There's something gross that I felt sitting next to my fellow Americans watching this movie. Oh. And I live in California and I know it's a pinko commie liberal state, but you feel it. And they not, do things, they show you things no, in yeah, this not movie. Not everywhere. Yeah, not everywhere, <laughs> but in Los Angeles. They show you images in this movie that I didn't know they were allowed to show in movies, but not for exploitation. Mm. It, it feels real. So two thumbs up for both those movies. Go enjoy yourself, folks. Come at me if you disagree. I'd love to hear it, but I think everybody's going to have fun. And you They're saw, because he, he co-wrote the 28 Years Later that's coming out with Killian Murphy, so you wrote, you wrote 28. Did you, did you see Devs? Because you and I liked um, Miss. Yeah, I saw, I saw Devs. You both saw it, Dave. Yeah. John and I yes. saw it. John and I, John and I talked about Men while Dave was in Australia a couple years ago. And we liked it. I, I, it was mixed reviews, but we, John, I really liked it. You guys really liked yeah. Dave's, right? So, so this yeah. is less. This is is this his least sci-fi movie since you know, like his absolutely. He did there's he there's, did. Mm-hmm. there's no. Yeah, maybe let's be more specific than sci-fi. I would put Alex Garland in the tech-centered storytelling, okay, yeah. but Men since he wrote the novel is not the tech-centered at no. all, right? Right. So so what does exist from he he tends to play with several elements that exist in all of his movies. This is still dystopian. So he has ventured into dystopian storytelling before with 28 Days Later. Yeah. Uh, the Beach is even I think it has a little bit of that. Like, is that present day or not? You can't kind of can't tell when you're watching that yeah. movie. Yeah. It's like, what time period does that take place in? Um, so he definitely is. He's in his, like, he's I in can't his believe Leo still. turned down movies for this. I'm sorry. Um, There's a few magnificent sequences, and I'm going to tip my caps <laughs> like fucking crazy. Shut up. I'm going to tip my caps like fucking crazy to all of the actors in it, especially Kirsten Dunst. She just, she fucking nailed it. And I think you'll know what I mean when you guys see it. Even though it's very subjective, it's not like this giant hero's journey where you're mm. kind of with her every frame, but she just exists so believably in every circumstance they put her in. And some of them are very heightened, filmy you know portrayals and i fucking bought every minute of it i hope you guys feel the same cool. i hope you love Everybody it Everybody go see fun. civil war go watch mm. go see civil I, war. It's, but, it's definitely on my agenda for this week if i can squeeze it in which i should wait, be able to know what I you think time. one of my favorite yeah, actors though is I, I forgot to mention is charles o copley how was he in monkey man is he awesome i just think he's such a fucking interesting actor i'm trying to th- who did he play do you he's know the guy with played? the microphone in the ring he was like the the box oh, in- dude so funny does he not have his, they- does he not have his south african accent that he always has no he does he does and he yeah, refers to go. himself as being from there it's of course so funny so funny and I, it, yes okay okay all right great. all right good movies I, back in the movie theater back Woo! in the i i swear on my life i'm gonna go so so much very 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 soon and so will you dave yeah i also dave you and i've talked about this before i just want to call out one more thing alex garland fucking owns the second quarter of the year he has released <laughs> Oh, every, every movie, yeah, every movie. movie he has ever made yeah. he's come out I around this was, time like, in this weird and time. no other yeah. movies are there to compete with him like for real like i, I saw monkey man you know night after the... it's so yeah. great and i it's, love it's... him for staking out that territory he's just that kind of filmmaker who's like i'm just gonna make enough to make the next one i'm gonna get enough good reviews i have a cult fucking following i don't need for people to blow me up any more than that and he's got so much respect in this community because of it i'm so so inspired by him Garland's like a, a scaled down version of like Taylor Swift. It's like I'm not going to go up against Garland. We'll shift the weekend. Yeah, 
<laughs> oh, and, and Civil War, Civil War was the <laughs> highest yeah, grossing yeah. A24 uh, opening weekend of all time at $25 million. Now, $50 million budget's a wow. little high for them. They don't usually have movies that are that expensive, but uh, $25 million actually almost doubled their second in place, their now second place film. So A24, Very for you guys to see good it. moment for A24 after the strike that they were able to work through the strike. And then it's so a good, good time for A24. All mm. right. Woo. I have the quickest gripe in the world. And then we'll get to our movies. You ready? I, I also have one. Oh, Dave, do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? You can go first. Okay, you ready? Okay, retail pharmacies. I've been hard on. <laughs> CVS, Dwayne Reed, Walgreens. I think there needs to be a That's Barnes and Noble part. style directory so I don't have to ask somebody where the hemorrhoid section is. The staff seems to hide it from people. Sure, like, sure. Especially if we buzz the, for the locked in section. Like if you buzz and you Which know, I found, if it's a sensation, I'm in a rush. But they, they were unmarked. So I'm looking around for this. Like it's out of nowhere. I'm looking like I feel like a lunatic running around. Then people are looking and then I get preparation H, which by the way is bright yellow and purple, which is really not it's really yeah, they conspicuous. Want it. They want you to see and know so that even when I like use it and I, I have to put the wrapper in the garbage, it's it's staring at the next person who uses it. Also, why is it between laxatives and diabetes? Laxatives I get, but diabetes, not for me. It's in the they, digestive section, isn't they, it? Yeah, <laughs> and they, they, they lock up the suppositories. And why is lidocaine so expensive? You need the good shit if you're gonna go, if you're gonna go for it, you gotta go for it. Lidocaine should not be so expensive. I didn't realize it was on the same level as like Sudafed. <laughs> Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm imagining you standing yeah. in this aisle. Do you pull your phone out and you're like, this is a good gripe. Did you like write Wait. down? Like, like, man. And also, why, you, why are you getting after, lidocaine? After, I actually what, are you, went, what are you putting in your asshole? That's the good shit, Dave. That's the, it's so much more expensive. I had to go to two different places because I forgot it thinking I didn't need it one time and I, I needed oh it. So I had gosh. to go back to a different oh place God. and get it. And your both of them were, hear this. Oh. both of them were wretched. <laughs> so... Good. Oh my God, that's so. Why funny, is it so dude. taboo? Everybody's got to go with it. You all know, guys. If, when you go and you see witch hazel, people are shameless with their witch hazel, but we can't talk about it. Yeah, you're putting this bright yellow and purple thing down. Someone's like, oh, he's either got hemorrhoids or it's so like, annoying that I have to like banana wrap. I've ever seen. It's a fucking wrapper. I just want to put it in the garbage. But I have to like wrap it because it's it's it might as well be fucking fluorescent. They might have put they put lights on it. <laughs> it's yellow Open and purple. <laughs> so bright. <laughs> Jesus Jeff, we gotta Christ. get you more veggies in your diet. Yeah, no, my diet fiber. was fine. I don't know what it is. It can't be my my diet's fine. Pretty you're fucking on your phone on the toilet. I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, too long on the on phone the on the toilet. toilet that's good. That means you're not pushing. <laughs> you're forcing. You're chill. You're relaxed. <laughs> All right, Dave? ladies and gentlemen, this episode has turned into an episode. <laughs> it's, on yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's hemorrhoids in 1984. It's, it's gonna make it in the show notes somehow. <laughs> All Dave, right. so, what are you upset about this week? Well, last week, um, I briefly mentioned to uh, Matt while he's on the show about how they're releasing the uh, the Dogma uh, restoration, the wow. 4K restoration of Dogma as a re-release to get around licensing and shit. There was a whole article quoting Kevin Smith and everything. Uh, yeah. It was an April Fool's joke. I got got big time. You Dave! Oh, yeah. Wow. I got got. Now, here's, here's my problem. Fuck you, Internet. If you're going to joke about anything, don't joke about Dogma. You know how many people are fucking waiting for that film? You got all These their hopes bastards. up and then smashed them. These oh, bastards. come on. Kevin Smith. Dude, I, I love that film. You cannot get it anywhere. Because I can't say why I'll get buzzed. But I've yeah. never seen it. I've never seen that Kevin Smith film. Wait, yeah, really? You, you'd probably enjoy that film. I don't think film. I've seen any Kevin Smith's film. I've never seen Clerks. What? I've what? never seen Jay and Silent Bob. I've never... Chasing Amy, Mallrats. I think I saw Chasing Amy, and I never saw Mallrats. You never saw Mallrats. No, no you appeal to you'd, me. Uh, there you, is no you Easter would, Bunny. You would absolutely it's a guy in a suit. Come you'd on, man. You absolutely get a kick out of Dogma. Okay. Right. Yeah. Dogma and Mallrats. Gotta but you go can't get it. it. Stan anyway. Lee. Fallen angels plan to employ an alleged loophole in the Catholic dogma to return to heaven after being cast out by God. Sounds pretty, pretty yep. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Nice. Well, okay. Dave. How does it Yo, feel? Do you feel? Oh my god! Wait, didn't you see the Carlin documentary where they talk about that getting Carlin to be? Is it God? Is it an angel or something in that? Um, uh, no, they had. Um, God is Alanis Morissette. Yeah, you know. Carlin plays somebody. Oh, wow. really, he plays like a funny like angel or something. In that it's really funny. that's funny. Yeah, it has. Okay. Uh, was it Alan Rickman? Was the uh, they got an incredible? Was the Metatron? Cast is incredible. Wow. Yeah, I gotta find out who fucking Carlin was in that. Um, okay, are you guys ready? What's our, we gotta check the 
This is the timestamp. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. That makes it this Jane Silent Bob joke sets up. It's like, well, it's Hollywood, so they'll probably cast you with Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, and who is just in Dogma. Anyway, are you guys ready? Finally. I'm so yes. ready. George just, Carlin plays it. Cardinal Glick. Oh, yes. The Cardinal, and he's got the hat and everything. It's yeah, so funny. with the buddy Jesus. He's got the hat and everything. Buddy loves you. Um, <laughs> buddy loves you. <laughs> And he uh, needs you know money. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people buying their way into heaven. That's for damn sure. You guys ready to talk about Paris, Texas? Not to be confused with Texas, Paris. Oh, boo. no, that, no, 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 no. That's a real movie. That's it. A... <laughs> I actually think it's called Texas is Paris. It's when the band Texas plays in Paris. I'm not that bad. Do you think that was seller. their first idea for the title? <laughs> Somebody's like, why don't we make a play on that Vin Vendors movie? <laughs> <laughs> you know that oh, Palm Dior winning movie from 1994? And this band was basically like the white snake of 1999. They were like, yeah, let's, let's do What's it. What's a Palm Dior? What's a Palm Dior? All okay. right, people. 1984. Not the book. George Orwell, not, not George Orwell, mm. not the book. Although it's a fun comedy romp for the whole family. Yeah, nice. <laughs> sure. you know, good Slice of life. Childish yeah. themes. Yeah. I don't think the sun is out for a minute in that book. Um, <laughs> we always start. I got a lot. We're, this is a fantastic film year. Oh, this my is, God. I was, this I, is nuts. I was putting together my favorite film years. It's definitely not in the top three, but it's competing somewhere between four and seven of my favorite film years out of the ones that we've researched so far. I now say I research, want to know your top say, three film years. Oh, I'll get there. I said researched okay, like okay. an asshole. I still think 1939, which we ta- I didn't realize how good it was until we talked about it recently. But 1999 and 2007 are like the two best of my lifetime, mm. I think. Nice. Um, and then, if, you know, a lot of people will say 75, 67, 89, 94. But um, I think 99 and 2007 are the, are the two best of our lifetime. And then That's 39 right. is just fucking good. Good years, dude. OK, now this is tricky because box office mojo, the num- it was really tight. So I checked the numbers and the numbers had different one, two, three. So it's it's a little confusing. So John, mm-hmm. I'm going to give you, 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 there are two answers that you could give that will be right. Dave, same with you. What was the highest, the highest grossing movie? Mm-hmm. Basically there's a, there's a top three and then the rest, you know, then the, the best of the rest. <laughs> what was the highest grossing movie of 1984 according to one of these sites? And I don't know why their numbers are different. Um, is it not Ghostbusters? So according to Box Office Mojo, Ghostbusters is number one with $229 million, which slightly beat out Beverly the Hills Cop. It? Beverly mm. Hills Cop. Yeah, at $224 sure. million. He was on fire. And then Indiana Jones and the Temple of Dune came in third at $179 million. However, the numbers. Wow. Now there were, they did this thing, and this is still in the 80s. They did this thing where in 1985, a lot of these movies re-released. <laughs> And so mm. I don't know if they counted as part of the initial run since it was so close to when they came out. I, it got very mm. confusing because something happened where like Beverly Hills Cop ended up passing Ghostbusters. So then Ghostbusters did a re-release the next summer to pass it as the highest grossing movie of all time. And so like, I know the highest grossing comedy of all time didn't pass Star Wars. And those. So it's like, anyway, they were just fucking battling each other. So I don't know if the numbers should count. But long story short, those two movies, along with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, those three movies made a lot of money. End of story. Number four is Gremlins. I love this. I'm back to box office mojo for the numbers, by the so way. That so funny, dude. The Karate Kid. Ralph Macchio, yeah. baby. Let's go. Ralph Macchio, yeah. by the way, named his son Daniel. Karate Kid <laughs> comes out at number four. Daniel's son. I'm going to let that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody yeah, just yeah. let that slide. He might as well just name him <laughs> Daniel's son. Number six, Police Academy. Number Solid seven, number people. Number People, <laughs> welcome to Superstardom. Welcome. Thank you for dancing into our lives. Kevin Bacon, Footloose, number Footloose. seven. Everybody go loose. Number eight, Romancing the Stone. Yes, yep. oh, I like that movie. Star Trek that, Three: The Search have? for Spock comes in at number nine, Dave. And Where did he go? Splash. <laughs> Splash comes in at number 10. And uh, if you're counting, that's uh, four Paramount Pictures movies in the top 10. Oh no! The um, opposite 
of today. Some, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about movies. We'll, you know, I'll open it up in a second to talk about more movies that came out this year. But a couple other highlights. Uh, Ghostbusters, again, we talked about that back and forth with Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, but Tootsie used to be the highest ranking comedy of all time, or the highest uh, grossing comedy of all time. And both of these movies just destroyed them, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. S- the beginning of this year, Silkwood topped the end of January as a number one, which came out in 1983. Ending the run of Terms of Endearment from 1983. So this is still that time period where the Oscars movies like owned the beginning of the year. Um, what's interesting is internationally, they all had different number ones. So like South Korea, Project A, a Jackie Chan movie in 1984. Jackie Chan, who is not from South Korea, by the way, Project A by Jackie Chan was their highest grossing movie of the year. Um Gremlins was Brazil's highest grossing movie. Uh, Police Academy was West <laughs> Germany's. So they all like spread the wealth. It's really interesting. Japan loved Indiana Jones. Gotta love it. Okay. A couple other things that came out this year. The PG-13 rating. So this also, I, we got to add this to like the importance of the 1984 year. And guess who, and this was a trivia question for me one time at the Fox and the Hound. Guess what Hollywood film personality proposed the PG-13 rating? And I'll give you a hint. We've already mentioned him on the show, and he had a lot of money at stake. Steven Spielberg. That's right, because (laughs) he was looking at Murphy's, like, I don't know, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, a much darker movie, and Gremlins, and he said, you know what, PG-13 sounds great. We need something between Parental Guardian and full-on R rating. My my characters need to say shit twice, so let's change it. Uh, Yeah, yeah, at least Ah. twice, yeah. Yeah. Um, February 15th. Walt Disney Studios established Touchstone Pictures so they can release more subject matter, like uh, more mature subject yeah, matters yeah. on the, the Disney banner. Romancing the Stone is released. So Catherine Turner, Michael Douglas, Danny DeVito, Bob Zemeckis, superstars from that movie, of course, and basically got Back to the Future greenlit right on the spot. Michael Eisner leaves Paramount Pictures on a good wow. year for films the top film yeah, yeah, to take over yeah. Walt Disney Productions, 1984. Damn, that's when he took over. Terror forever. Uh, and he replaced Jeffrey Katzenberg, <laughs> who was later named chairman. Uh, Dune is released at the end of the year. The original Dune, of course. Uh, a lot of hype and anticipation. And then Breakdancing, the first Breakdancing musical is released. Breakin', soon followed by Beat Street and Breakin' 2. So Breakdancing took over. Oh my God, dude. Little award <laughs> season buzz before we talk about any other movies you want to shout out. Uh, Amadeus will go on to win a whole bunch of Oscars. I believe the final count was eight. That includes Best Picture. Milos Foreman would win Best Director. F. Murray Abraham, that you might have seen in The White Lotus last year. Some of my favorite lines in that. Amadeus. Sally Field wins her second Oscar. Dave, we just talked about her uh, first one recently when she won for um, Sally May, Fanny May. Was it for Stay Hungry? Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. We talked about 1976 movie. Uh, Let's see. Um, Broadway Danny Rose, Woody Allen won the BAFTA, but uh, not the Oscar this year. I just called to say I love you. Stevie Wonder would win an Oscar for Best Song. Ennio Morricone won Best Original Score at the BAFTA for Once Upon a Time in America, but would not win his Oscar until The Hateful Eight 30 years later. And uh, we got to say it here. Guys, Vim Vendors won the Palme d'Or, as we talked about. Ennio won the BAFTA for Best Director for this movie. Paris, wow. Texas, and the last bit of movie trivia before I pass on for you to highlight some other movies because there are so many other amazing <clears throat> movies that I want you guys to start talking about a little bit is our boy in Paris, Texas, Harry Dean Stanton, came out with five movies in 1984. Oh God, now, he was dude. already basically a star because of Alien, right? And then he had, yeah. uh, where's my list here? Oh, don't forget, Cockfighter. From 1974, about he did a trainer of cocks. No, Dave, not <laughs> porn, but pretty close. But he did Private Benjamin in 1980, and he did Death Watch and mm. Escape from New York. So he was already a known person. In fact, Sam Shepard, who was going to... I'm, I'm teasing Paris, Texas a little bit here. Sam yeah, Shepard, yeah, yeah, the writer yeah. of the movie, was originally cast by Vim Vendors to be Travis in our movie. But Hollywood decided if they wanted to give some money, they needed a name. So Harry Dean Stanton was a name. Um, Sam Shepard was not. In 1984, Harry Dean Stan came out with Paris, Texas, Repo Man, UFO Aurea, The Bear, not the TV show, and Red Dawn. He was in five movies that came um, out this year. Didn't Rob Mueller yeah. also shoot Repo Man? The cinematographer? God, did he really? I think so, yeah. He was working a lot, wasn't he? He was cooking a lot. All right. Um, you guys want to highlight some other movies that I'm not came sure out in 1984? I have a list here. There's a whole bunch. Any ones that you want to you wanna shout out? 
I think we got to count out the uh, the iconic John Hughes 16 candles for sure. Yeah. Uh, I was young. Not not born yet, but these movies played a lot on re- <laughs> syndication when I was growing up. The never ending story. I was mm-hmm. obsessed with that movie. Oh, yeah. My favorite Muppets movie, Muppets Take Manhattan, mm-hmm. came out in 1984. Fucking the, the frog is dead. You know, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. I love that movie so much. Um, 1984. Came out in 1984, which Mm -hmm. was the birth of Roger Deakins into commercial cinema, and everything has just uh, been lovely since then. Mm. Um, And the toxic event, I just want to call out the, I always like talking to our listeners, we have been here twice before. We have done the Toxic Avenger, and we have done um, Conan. Is it, or is that a different Conan? Conan the Destroyer. Conan the Destroyer. This is the sequel, okay, to mm. the other Conan that we've done. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to call those out. How about you, Dave? You got any special ones? Nope. Dave, you just trying to move on. Guys, ones. <laughs> guys, I have two. Wait, I have two. Wait, hold on. The Killing Fields is fucking yeah. magnificent. If everybody if anybody wants to go see a really hard to watch Vietnam War movie, that, <laughs> that is depressing, but it's beautiful. And Jeff, <laughs> you and I one time were watching television really high, and we came upon this movie called The Bachelor Party. Oh yeah, Where Tom have, Hanks, I've seen that so many times. The three of us were living together, and Tom Hanks is in this movie, and we were like, "What is this? It's a bachelor party movie, and it's kind of an '80s oh, classic." Oh my god! And then you're this right. donkey comes into the bachelor party <laughs> and does a bunch of cocaine, and we just could not stop laughing about this movie. <laughs> cocaine we were donkey. too stoned oh to like god. remember it very well. So uh, we yes. Trying to <laughs> point proven. Uh, <laughs> so hilarious. Bachelor party came out here. Couple of other guys. We All got right, okay. Good. Well, we have we have talked about other movies. Ones we didn't talk about include The Natural, Children of the Corn, Purple Rain, Stop mm-hmm. Making Sense. Um. A Nightmare on Elm Street, Rhinestone, uh, Place in the Heart. I think I mentioned Starman. And Dave, Supergirl came out this year. You like that 1984 Supergirl film? Oh my God. No, I, tried to, I tried to rewatch that recently and I just, I got about 15 minutes in and fuck me, it's bad. I had a feeling. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. And then actually, we have sort of talked about a couple other movies there, John, just to, just to highlight some. Uh, in the summer blockbuster face off, we talked about Ghostbusters, of course. We also talked about the terminator but that was more so in the franchise face-off because it technically was not the highest grossing movie of its year but in the franchise face-off we talked about the terminator we did talk about the karate kid and we sort of talked about temple of doom but not really and we definitely talked about beverly hills cop in the box office face-off uh, in there fact was beverly i hills paid cop for two i believe two well, yeah, I, okay, but but I rewatched Beverly Hills Talk and I made sure to put it in the conversation oh, okay, okay, because okay, okay, I okay. paid for Paramount Plus because I did the free trial to, to watch that movie for our podcast and then I forgot to cancel <laughs> it. And I said, has actual Foley come out yet? Did I miss it? Because they were advertising the shit out of it. God, I hope not. <laughs> I'll just share one quick, one other quick little anecdote just because it's a beautiful little film story. Uh, I went to the, for Amadeus, I went to the uh, Geffen Hall Ah. And I heard the New York Philharmonic play the live score to Amadeus. Ah. Ah. And just the requiem, the basically. During the screening of that wonderful Mozart music ah. being played live, we all walked out, checked our phones. Milos Forman, the director, passed away during that performance. He was not there. No. He was in Connecticut where I think he lived, but so moved. So Everybody they played so him out with it. a requiem mass? How fucking beautiful is that? Oh, like, it was so mess. Oh my moving. God, him. It was so cool. Not for him, Dave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so right, right, I, gave right. you, I, gave you my, I gave you my list of film years. I think I put this at number four. 1967 is great, but there's only like five movies. I know they're important, but I, I think with, I think this comes at number four. 75 is great. A um, couple other things that happened in the world really quick. Again, we got to set the context. Paris, Texas takes place in the heart of America. Sam Shepard and Vim Benders. Shepard was a, a Chicago actor, writer, and Vim Benders was German who studied in Europe. He studied <laughs> painting and he lived above a cinema in France or some shit. And then um, they loved the American West. Well, let's see what was going on uh, around the world, including in America. The Indian prime minister was murdered, assassinated, if you will. Uh, his wow. name was Indira Gandhi. The original Apple Macintosh personal computer went on sale, and a Super Bowl ad in 1984 wow. added a Orwellian Orwellian themed 1984. Uh, get it? You know who directed ad. that? Uh, don't tell me Kubrick. It was like somebody famous. Ridley Scott. Oh, interesting. Right? Maybe I'm wrong. I think it was him. No, you're right. Top pop musicians gathered in Notting Hill studio to form Band Aid and recorded the song "Do They Know It's Christmas." 
Uh, a massive year-long <laughs> minor strike began uh, and took up basically the whole year in England. Uh, the 1984 Summer Olympics were held in Los Angeles. Going to be heading in Los Angeles again pretty soon there, John. I can't, you ready for the yep. traffic? No. The Soviet Union boycotted <laughs> it, by the way. different. <laughs> yeah, I was um, just say, can it get any worse? <laughs> um, can it be any worse? Uh, USA first solo transatlantic flight in a helium balloon. <laughs> we needed that. The, yeah. Thank God. The first Should ever... The first ever untethered Can you spacewalk. Your voice would be. <laughs> you just... Yeah. Ah! Um, the first ever untethered spacewalk is something that I never ever want to do. So fuck yeah. space. I'm right? not doing an untethered spacewalk. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, you, uh, you'd want to have your launch like, like real fucking confidence in your push off. Oh God, yeah. Salmon, yeah, uh, pesticide plants. Um, did some shit in India. Leaks of lethal toxic gas, killing 3,500. Virgin Air God is introduced damn. to the world in 1984 to be the uh, 1980s version of Pan Am. Um, Major League Baseball set a record for the longest game of all time. The Chicago White Sox and the Milwaukee Brewers played the longest ever game. Eight hours and six minutes, 25 innings. The game had to be spread across two days until the Brewers eventually pulled out a 7-6 win. That is not a high enough scoring game for 25 I innings. would rather do the untethered spacewalk than watch that <laughs> baseball. <laughs> <laughs> a couple other things really quick. Um, HIV was identified. <laughs> Rate oh, shit. <laughs> Silence. Yeah, right. <laughs> we, we fucking... <laughs> yeah. No one yeah. breathed. Oh, gee, no. I'll, I'll just make a HIV joke and see how we go. Yeah, great. Oh, I um, God. I saw this headline, but Tetris Ugh. dropped its first block. Boo. I saw the headline. Come on. Oh, I'll allow it. Dave, I'll allow it. Alex Trebek gave his first answer as the host of Jeopardy. What is? 1984. That's all I've got. Marvin Gaye was shot and killed by his father in Damn. 1984. His uh, you, parents, Gay. his parents were in a dispute, and he tried to break it up. But his dad got angry, pulled yep. out a gun, and accidentally shot him to death. In Fucking point black shot range. him while he was sleeping. He went the, into his bed. He the went first into his bedroom. And I be, him. Sorry, according to the I'm story, said there was a dispute. Anyway, the first ever MTV VMAs, and guess what? Thriller lost to the Cars. The Cars won Best Video over <laughs> Thriller at the MTV. <laughs> Madonna gave her very famous Like a Virgin performance there. And I skipped over one so that I would go back to it. Ronald Reagan, back to our movie now, 1984, in November, won with 58.8% of the vote. But more importantly, this motherfucker won 49 out of 50 states. All but opponent James Mondale's, James Mondale's, who gives a shit? Mondale's home state of Minnesota. Wow. He won 49 states. Also, he won 49 states and only got 58% of the vote. Just do the math. It seems a little crazy, right? I forgot one thing. Crack cocaine showed up in Los Angeles, John, just in time for the Olympics. Snowfall. God damn it. Dave, you ready to talk about My this movie? Or, uh... I, I think everybody's ready. Uh, welcome back to everyone who skipped 45 <laughs> minutes of this episode. <laughs> oh, come on. We had so much fun now. All right, people. Any other movies from 1984 you want to talk about? Or uh, <laughs> Dave is dying to talk about nothing else but one movie. All right, people. We already did the setup. Vim Vendors, Paris, Texas, available on Max, or if yes, you're me, is. available on my Apple TV, which is the only place that didn't kick me out for using John and his brother's account. <laughs> 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 Max, oh, that's good. I have a non-gripe, but I'm just, I, I'm really I, I pissed can't wait off. Till every... I can't wait till that's like a felony, and they go through our episodes. Uh, they're not going <laughs> to backlog that. Fucked. We're all going to be grandfathered in. Do you after fucking Napster congressmen, Congress people like... are going to be fucked, so they wouldn't write that law into effect. Were you, were you guys worried for like a moment in time that like they were to come after you for all of your illegal music downloads? I thought I was invincible. I, had I was like, fuck gigs. it. I had, yeah, I had, I had like gigabytes. 90 gigs of fucking Yo, illegal I had a music fucking download. app called Sanudi, which is iTunes spelled backwards, and you can rip anybody's iTunes that was on your network area. So when I was living in the dorm, <laughs> oh anybody, anybody in the dorm online, I could literally steal that. <laughs> and in fucking college, we had the fucking like T1 modem. So you could download oh, the entire baby. library in like oh, three minutes. Yo. Fucking 30. Oh, that's good. I had I had albums that I didn't need, like a double disc of Bone Thugs and Harmony. I was like, fuck that. Let's go. <laughs> Maybe that's what inspired Apple to give away U2's album. 
<laughs> gonna miss everybody because i'm gonna miss everybody okay. yeah cross okay. i don't you know it, it wasn't an album with crossroads it was an album with, with this, <laughs> oh, no. the, the song the, the money they made from crossroads they put into a double disc album <laughs> can we please just talk about the fucking movie both thugs in harmony of an oscar dave i think we should uh spend a minute talking about them <laughs> They won an Oscar before your fucking boy, Roger Deakins, ever won an Oscar. They have more oh Oscars than anybody God. in this fucking movie, Dave. Okay, oh are you ready? Oh, my God, it's so funny, dude. It's so funny. Are you ready to talk? Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so it's available on Max. Go rent it. Look at it. Watch it. The BAFTA winning Jeff, film, Paris, Texas. about the Masters. Scotty's the dude. I'm sorry. Dude. I'm Scotty's fucking with you, Scotty. Dave. I'm funny. I'm fucking with you. Don't worry. It's my week. Travis... Yeah. Henderson, this is the IMDb pitch before I send it on your way. Travis Henderson, an aimless drifter who has been missing for four years. I don't know how he slept or ate, by the way. Wanders out of the desert and must reconnect with society, himself, his life, and his family. Paris, Texas. What'd you think? What'd you feel? John had seen this before. Dave, I believe you I have, have not. not. First watch. I don't know how I missed this. Would you like to start? Sure. Because you've been waiting patiently. <sighs> are we are we ready? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> um yeah, I had only I had you can no pronounce idea. her name. Natasha can I just said it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I was one of the people who was behind pushing for this because I'd, I'd never seen it. And like like you said, like Roger Deakins keeps bringing it up. And it's it's one of those ones that is well known for like innovation in cinematography and what he does with color and shadow and stuff like that. And that's not all it is, but holy hell, that is a part of it. Like every frame of this film is interesting. Some of the... Yeah. Some of the production design they put into like just filling the space or not filling the space, like it. it and the uh, I don't know whether anyone else noticed, but the, the technique, the shooting technique changes as the story moves into different phases and stuff like that. There's mm. it, it's it's a like it's a long watch, and there's the story is fairly like drawn out, but it's you do, it doesn't suffer for it. It's definitely if you're interested in cinematography and what can be done with like the most simple setups then this is this is definitely something to watch. Mm-hmm. No shit. Dave, mm. I love it. John, um, re- rewatch for you? Rewatch for me. Yeah, Robbie Mueller, he did To Live and Die in L.A. He did uh, Barfly. What are some other like really famous ones he did? Uh, Dead Man, that Johnny Depp um, black and white Western, I don't know if anybody's seen that. Breaking the Waves. Anyway. Yeah, uh, actually, he's, his, he's worked with Jim Jarmusch quite his, a bit. His last, well. his last film was Living the Light, which is actually, a, I think, a documentary about him. About um, him. Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone made it out of footage. He appears in it. And I think that's going to be my watch for this week, given what I saw in wow, the Yeah. Wow. By the way, if you if you have never looked up Robbie Mueller's IMDb photo, do it. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, yes. It's so cool. Is it out there with Vangelis? <laughs> I mean, it's just a totally different kind of. It's, it's no Vangelis, but it's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he looks pretty awesome. Um, yeah, this is a. This is a. It's got Palm Door written all over it, doesn't it? It's a yeah. slow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, very patient film that still somehow has. There's like an. There's a there's a humor to it. Mm-hmm. It exists in kind of a, it's not droll, but it, it, it's kind of a, there's no urgency around the humor. And the humor somehow exists in almost an absurd way to yeah. what seems like a very dramatic, um, kind of r- ridiculous story that this man uh. abandoned his family <laughs> mm. and is now coming back into society and reintegrating which he didn't really initiate. Like he's kind of being he's spotted, he kind of gets pulled back in by his brother. And you learn about basically what went wrong with him. But eventually it's not Hollywood with the way they handle it. Yeah, yeah. Eventually. Yeah. Very much eventually. It's not Hollywood with the the way they handle it at all. 
It's very subtle. It's very human. You almost don't feel Sam Shepard, Sam Shepard's pen in this at all. True. Very true. Like, which is very, and I love Sam Shepard on Sam Shepard. A lot of his plays are very dialogue driven and very, I mean, I think he's a wonderful writer and he's a very human writer. But a lot of the times the voice is very much mirroring what's happening to the character and the body. And this movie, and I don't know if it's because he was writing with Vim Vendors or for Vim Vendors. And I'm sure if you well, guys listen to this, that Team this Deacon's a, episode. This was adapted by someone else, wasn't it? Like he wrote the Well, he wrote the original and then it was did adapted. Did you guys listen to the Team Deacons episode? Like mm-hmm. they wrote the it. first part. He wrote the first part. And then Sam Shepard moved on to oh, yeah. another project. And yeah. but told so they him, didn't really know what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. He gave him notes on how, how it was supposed to he, he pulled yeah. he pulled a George R. R. Martin. Honestly, it feels it feels mm-hmm. pretty seamless though. Like I if you hadn't told me that, I wouldn't have thought, oh, there's a different writer who comes on halfway through this. Um no, no. but yeah, uh, so I guess I'll just say, and I felt similar to the way i I watched it the first time. There is something hypnotic about watching slow cinema. And if you allow yourself the time and the patience to just kind of s- tap into this sort of off kilter slice of life is really what it feels like. Cause once he's back in the world, which is the opening of the movie is him coming back. There's not a lot of time that passes a few days. Yeah. That kid, feels that, like, kid is know, having like a, a, that kid is having a rough week. <laughs> what a week for this kid. This kid had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Is it a far, it's probably less than two weeks, right? Yeah. I mean, it feels like the boy, it takes them a while to get back to LA. And then he eventually, you know, stay there for a couple of days. And then it's about him going back to Houston. He decides maybe we won't go all the way back. No, I do need to go back. And I'm going to try to make him reconnect with the mother and probably two weeks maximum. So it's not like there's this enormous amount of passage of time, which what is the benefit of that storytelling wise? A lot can happen um, with a few issues of conflict and obstacles in, internally with characters. So it's not like they cover tons and tons of ground over like, what is it like to reintegrate into society and reunite with your family? And and it's the inflection points of all of those things. I feel like also inflection points of those kinds of conversations. The characters make weird decisions, but based off the motivation that the character has. Definitely. At that point. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a strange, there are that story that he tells if anybody is watching the video that I have a screenshot of behind me. Oh, yeah. When oh, he, I thought that was just yeah. what when you did f- on the weekend. Sure. Oh, come on. Beautiful. Beautiful. What a scene, by the way. What a, what a beautiful, simple scene. Yeah. So much stillness, so much patience, patience, so much restraint, and just some actors just living in the moment. We just happen to be in the room with them. But when you finally learn in the last 26, 5, 7 minutes of this movie why he left and what he hopes to achieve from bringing her and his son, her, her son, their son back together. There is an absurdity to it, which Sam Shepard is so good at writing that. So I don't know if he, I can't remember from the podcast, if he came back and helped write this last monologue. He dictated he reveals, over the phone. He dictated over the thought phone. He did. It is almost inappropriate. It is yeah. taboo. It is human. Though it feels fucking all, like you don't want to acknowledge that this is so real for so many people. It's just this guy decided he had had enough and he left because of it. But the circumstances are so relatable to so many humans that we like we just don't like having. Well, I mean, he's, this kind he, of subject matter these days. He's like, going off the rails, movies, though, like, right? Yeah, by that point, like when he when when he's talking about what he did, like he, I know he was up, dude. yeah. I, and I'm not celebrating him. It's, I'm not yeah. saying it's cool that he did no, that. No, but like, what but, a what an excellent payoff for the because the first scene where like because there's two of those scenes there. We haven't let Jeff speak yet, but I'll keep going anyway. Um, I've spoken a lot yeah. this episode. <laughs> um, yeah, you have. Uh, <laughs> we that first scene where he's in the the phone on the phone tour in the other room, right? And it's so <clears throat> frustrating to watch. I was sitting on the edge of my seat. I'm like fucking angry. I'm like, just tell her. Yeah, like don't exactly. sit there in silence. Just fucking tell her. But he puts the phone down and walks away, and I'm like, "You fucking idiot!" Like, and I'm, I feel like that is exactly the reaction they were going for, and I played right into their fucking hands. 
And then yeah. to get that payoff where he goes back, like just makes that scene really fucking punchy in the guts. And again, so, which what's beautiful about this kind of movie, and I pick on I pick on the Con Festival sometimes with like the kinds of movies that they choose. Sometimes they just really love esoteric stuff and they love edgy taboo material. Also, you know what? Three but, three minutes standing ovation is okay. It's okay. Is that what this got? Did no. this get it? No, but they, oh, like, they're up to, they're I think they're up to 10, been. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't, yeah, we get it. We get it. Yeah. Um, uh, are these days access? What I do love about do? this, though, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> what I do love about back. this, though, is that there is a, what you're saying, Dave, there is a deliverance of humanity within the context of a man's ethics that I don't agree with and that I think a lot of people okay. might disagree with or feel uncomfortable with. And yet you do, you still feel that like there has been something achieved, something good does come out of it. I don't know if the right thing to do at the end of this movie is for him to just leave again, but he brought his do- his wife and his son estranged back together. And it was his fault that they had dispersed. And there's something lovely and real and human mm. about that that did not feel like a happy ending, which no. is so hard. Ugh. I have to ask right? as that well. That's so fucking In the, in the dialogue, when, like when he's talking about he woke up and he was on fire, that was oh. that was a meta that was a metaphor, right? Did, or did she actually fucking set him on fire? Because no, it wasn't that, clear. That had to be, I actually rewatched it. it. I think it was it had to be metaphor, but it was uh, not metaphor clear. or. I could see it a Sam Shepard play somebody fucking lighting somebody on fire though. Who yeah, cares? Right? right. I could see it. Like I kind of felt like maybe was, she fucking just lit the bit, fucking place yeah. on fire. And they yeah, and they were gone. But yeah, it could have easily been metaphor. It was that where where do you think, just to give the listeners a little context, in that monologue, is that like minute seven where he finally talks about that point? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, 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 like yeah, that. yeah. yeah. So like you were just you I, I was in like a fucking trance listening to this but man the, the, in the this thing shot is, mostly like, in this yeah. shot <laughs> talking the, about the thing is you get to that point like you're like oh we're finally going to find out what happens and then when you find out what happens you're like I didn't want to know that I didn't and it know, might not I even know. be a good enough excuse for most people yeah for, right it's like it doesn't it kind of doesn't matter it forces you to confront the fact that different people have different breaking points and you it doesn't even matter if you judge it or not. All that matters are the consequences. And that's the only mm. reason he's in that room. And Dave, just technically, and I know, Jeff, we haven't gotten to you yet. There's an enormous amount of patience. It's a very slow cinema. But when they choose to cut in and out of these two rooms, and when they choose to show you what the other person can see through the glass, that, and yeah, when yeah. they can't, is yeah. so interesting to me. When they are just inside an invasive single, so that you can't see what they're looking at, and you can't, they're almost looking like it's almost portrait style versus something like this where we can see her and she's looking or his over the shoulder. Like, it was just so mm. nuanced, it's so subtle. And it I takes was, so I was long a little, to get to those I was cuts, a little distracted but... by the production design in that one because when she turns around and leans against the wall, there's like fucking pink bats sticking out of the wall because they haven't finished that wall. Like, and it's, it's um, yeah, it's like insulation. I'm I like, spent about oh, a minute of that monologue like, being oh, like, building. Oh, that's right. I was trying to read that's it right. It's, yeah, it's like that's right. It's uh, it's the eighties. They didn't know that shit gave you cancer yet. It's like just stick it out of the fucking wall. I loved it, Jeff. Fuck, I'm sorry, dude. No, go, it's please right. go. I'm so I'm sorry. I kind of no, no, no. I, I kind of I almost want to. <laughs> I feel like my memory of this movie is going to be backwards in the sense that and I ne- I've never done this in film, but I kind of want to work backwards, but not to spoil, because. You said, John, like it's it's hypnotic, but it took me a while to be hypnotized by it. It was very slow. And I was like, okay, so this is the first time that we're going to go back in time and see a movie that isn't just like, this is why the movie's good. Because now it's like, we actually have to talk about the experience of watching this very slow, very droll movie. I loved it, that it was, the character wasn't talking. And I, I love it. it There's so many things that were very interesting about it. But we're back going back to working backwards, the hug, you said it wasn't a happy ending. The hug was my happy ending because mm. that hug was yeah. one of the most moving hugs I've ever seen in, in film Jesus of all Christ, time. right? And it was basically like, I know it wasn't going to be a happy ending, but that I was being hugged. No, like, so like you're, you're, I know it's not a happy ending, but this is life. And, and at least we have this. And I was like, yes. And then moving back, 
that monologue was huge. But when she says things like, I wanted to see him so bad, I didn't dare imagine him, or every man had your voice or your voice would wake me up after you hear oh. the story. Oh. And then going back into that story where as soon as he starts and he goes, I'm going to tell you a story. And you're like, oh man, why is he doing this? And then he starts saying it. And the story's so good that you're okay with him not, to, as to your point, Dave, just fucking tell her, just say the truth, just speak the truth. It's like, it's so worth it. Even though you know he's dancing around. He's he's not, he's like, he's he's telling a more important truth than the truth, you know? And, and this whole thing is basically, the whole movie is what the fuck happened to him over four years? Yeah. And when this story happens, you realize in that moment, let it go. And it's funny because when don't uh, yeah. don't Dean, Dean Stockwell is on the, they're on when they're up on the uh, billboard, and he just loses oh. his shit. And he's like, what the fuck happened to you for the last four years? Stop with the bullshit and just tell me. Yeah. He was channeling everyone watching this film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> while, the, while out of all the billboards that they could hang, that's the billboard that and they put up there. how badly in his story were you waiting for her to go, Travis? Yeah. Right? And yeah. they just wouldn't give it to you. And, like, yeah. and how oh. amazing it was that she, you could recognize that she was laughing and you know she it was a relatable story but she didn't she didn't have an aha moment that we love in movies those like it's me moment it was like oh it, it's almost hard I, I i actually i did rewind i i, I rewound and i watched mm. it again there's, there's, a, really, there's and, a couple of things where they relied on just performances like this that one i i want to say the when they sit down and watch the home movie yeah um which mm. was fantastically shot as well uh but the performances in that were just heartbreakingly good. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. cause all you know is she's not there anymore, but you're seeing a couple who are so, so, so very much in love. And you're like, what the fuck happened to these poor, poor people? And mm -hmm. it just, it makes, again, it, it builds that tension. It's like, are we going to find out what happened to these people? Like what happened to these people? Yeah. I need to know what happened to these people. I want to know. I'm going to keep watching this. It's brilliant. And what made them burst, which the poetry in that is so yeah. great, you know, and I love just honest, raw truth, but we cut, we basically got it, even though it's definitely storyized, you know, it's definitely poetic and it's not a hundred percent real and accurate. And I, again, I don't know how he, he probably didn't survive for four years. It seems impossible, but at the same time, who gives a shit, but even working backwards, I mean, so the, the scene with him and the boy after he, after that first, the first time in the peep show where he's walking through, I mean, it's, that's hypnotic. That to me is mm. hypnotic when he's in there and the boy's outside in Texas yep. and he's in this hanging out in place, an alleyway and he's in the wrong place. Gen X. And he, that, that whole scene. And then he finally, he gets the girl into the wrong girl. And you know, it's like, so it's, and then, and then the whole motel scene afterwards where that's like the most honest he is. That's like the most truthful with him and the boy. And he's, he went to the bar, but he didn't get like drunk, drunk. Cause he's got a little bit more of a lid on it. Back up a little more. This is a road movie, and I love a road movie. It's two but road it's actually, movies. It's two road movies, exactly, Dave. It's yeah. actually this is. There, I know that usually there's like a third act. There's really two. Maybe the third act is the monologue at the end, but this is two different movies. You're totally right. It totally shifts. They talk about it a little bit in the Deacons podcast, although not exactly in this way. But by the time you get to the second, oh, did they actually movie, talk about like, the movie for the whole podcast? No, no, they didn't talk about the movie. But he talks about how to how they filmed it. They're already and doing talks better about than us. Like Dave, Dave, you got to hear this Teamster story. We got to tell you the Teamster story with him. And, and the oh, that's reason. so good. It's, it's so good. But yeah, anyway, so back to the first thing where it's like, so now I'll go back to the beginning now that we're at the halfway point. And it's like, knowing that now, I want to go back and rewatch this beginning that I wasn't hypnotized by. I want to see this. I want to see the story on his face. Because the crazy thing is we know now they hadn't actually written the end of the movie mm. when they started. But Harry, the actor, did. The actor, the actor did. Yeah, I believe that actually all the actors did. But they they knew also, the end of the movie, like, even though they didn't have the script. At the beginning of the movie, like this gigantic opening shot. How many takes do you think that took? Because all they, they pan I mean, through a fucking canyon and then just down yeah, on him. Remarkable, walking. right? But from yeah. that point on until pretty much he's taken into the house, it becomes a tripod on sticks. Like, oh, sorry, camera on sticks. Film where it's literally just a single point camera. There's very little motion. We're just panning and tilting. Done. Okay, the, the, the short version yeah. of this is the director of this movie refused <laughs> to allow 
himself to be driven because the way he wrote he wanted to write in sequence he wanted to write chronologically he didn't know how else to do it but to do a road movie so he knew he wanted to do a road movie so that he could film chronologically and he had the set pieces picked out yep. but all of those shots he he, he basically picked he, he had some ideas but he, he did them on the day so he would drive and everybody would follow him and he would stop and everybody would pull over and he would say here and they would start shooting that's cool Kind of straight. Although, isn't it crazy, Dave? It was, it's quite funny. I was uh, I was actually reading another article about the the cinematographer where he had no concept of what a key and fill light were, as such. He just knew he needed a light there, and then the grips are trying to tell him you need another light here for fill. And he's like, "Why do I need another light there?" They got in so many like back and forths because he he could he had didn't really have a concept of why he needed that fucking fill light. And he just really wanted high contrast, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. contrast shifts around a lot, which is great. But also, like, I can talk about the color timing on this for hours because, like, it was done Probably with it was done with love. Talk about it, yeah, because, I mean, Vin Vendor's films are, are – there's so much interesting color in yeah. his movies. That's why he brought people mm. from Europe over on uh, tourist visas and then had them work illegally because he needed his crew. <laughs> <sighs> I – uh I think it's really beautiful that you touched on that you touched on how how the hug at the end and we're talking literally we're not saying a figurative hug from the no. filmmaking we're talking like there's this beautiful hug at the end the idea of going back and looking at that I think we could like celebrate the acting from all the adults all day long because the magic trick of pulling off not knowing what the ending is writing as you go this honesty of um, not being too literal with with really human emotions that we've already kind of been discussing. But the little boy, the little boy, I feel like was like, I'm so curious to know how much of what his line, how much of his lines were written and how much of it was like, maybe them, them the director, maybe off to the side, kind of telling him what to say as they were, it has that quality of some of those I, really. I think great... there are, there's one or two as well where it just like they would they would just shoot, sit in there shooting the shit and they filmed it. Honestly, like there's a yeah, couple of times, way, a couple there? of times where the conversation's so natural and that kid's answering. It's it's like what they just sat there and rolled until they got something. Well, I think Sam because the the character has the same name as the kid, so it leads me to believe that they named the kid after him just to make it easier on set and everything. His name's Hunter. In real life and his name's mm. hunter in the movie so it made and, and he said he likes sam shepherd he had the story all picked up but he can't write dialogue especially not in american characters he, he just can't do it Vim. so that's why he needed sam to do the ending but i believe he was there for a lot of the beginning of it and i think that i wouldn't be surprised if sam did write to the kid's voice much like the forrest gump mm. anecdotes that you know i wouldn't be surprised i also just want to g give it up for um also i'd like to point out that i had that video game in return of the jedi sheets what video game? <laughs> nice, the game nice. he's playing in his bedroom. I had that. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. my god, that's funny. How good is Dean Stockwell? Yeah, in the, he's so good. There are so many like Jeff. I think you know what I mean. Like the opportunities for overacting mm -hmm. the person who's trying to get information from the the un you know, nebulously quiet person yeah. you know for whatever that scenario is the mystically quiet mute or whatever it doesn't matter if they're family brothers or if they're the way that that could have been overdone was already like that was ripe with problems for a shitty actor but also his specificity in their relationship i, I guess those guys knew each other they had done some i think they had done some work together before him this is 1983 they made no, that's not true. They hadn't worked together yet. I don't think because they made some David Lynch films together eventually, but I don't think they had done anything. Weren't they on separate films? You're talking about Dean, Dean Stockwell? Yeah, Dean Stockwell and Harry Dean Stanton. I thought they were in some stuff together. Anyway, it doesn't oh. matter. Dean Stockwell specificity. He's the guy from Air Force with his One. Relationship. That's what he is, by the way. Sure. The secretary. Quantum leap all the way. Okay. It's just, a, it's such a, if I, I'm just trying, I'm imagining myself analyzing the script. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm playing Dean Stockwell's part. It's up to me. And entirely up to me to create the specificity of our relationship because he did he Travis doesn't do it at all. No. Harry Dean Stanton doesn't really give you anything. It's not on the nope. page, certainly. So, you know, he's in the way he's gonna be acting, maybe you don't know the answer to that. 
maybe he'll give you some looks that give you like, oh, there he is. But you can't count on that. All I know is that I need to show up and the one, me, the actor is trying to solve these problems and be specific. But two, I need to make sure my character is trying to help help this man remember these dynamics of our relationship so that he'll feel he'll open up and start coming back to life and rejoin us. And I just, it's just one of those performances where I, I kind of don't even believe that Dean Stockwell was like, did he know he was acting? And it just feels like there was a camera <laughs> well, in the room. Guy. It just felt also, so fucking real. Also, also, his opening shot made me laugh out loud. When he was at work? Was he, he yeah, the... he's on the phone and there's a building behind him. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with that building? Did they put a model behind him or something? And then it cuts out and it's it's not, it's a painting he's standing in front of. Yeah. I, love, yeah. I love when Travis is like, you make all those? Some of them are beautiful. Like you would think he might be like, I, you know, whatever. And he's like, I don't make all of them, Travis. And it's just like a weird, funny yeah. thing that they do. Um, he was a child actor. He was, he's been in over 200 movies and TV shows, but since he was like six years old, he was in front of a camera. So I think, you know, yeah. even in, in that okay. era, it was wow. a little hammy in the studio time and stuff, but so, some kids and some people were able to just be so comfortable in front of it that they don't have, I think by the time he did this movie, he had already been in almost a hundred things. Seriously, like since the early forties <laughs> to this movie, like I think he'd been in over a hundred things. So I think he just he knows he doesn't have to do anything he's just so comfortable and competent in front of it because in the family stuff too i mean his wife and her connection to hunter is she attracted to travis all this stuff that maybe somebody yeah, I got like, that they didn't well. play that out they didn't play this out they didn't and it's like it's just a weird time it's it's confusing she realizes everything is going to be different everything's going to be different as soon as travis comes back why was he gone and for the- four years why did you go to fucking Paris, Texas? And they said, why did you go to Paris? He said, I forgot. I mean, these things, again, I, I'm watching this and it's like, it runs a fine line between like droll and boring and the most brilliant thing ever. Mm. And Nata- Nastasia Kinski and Aurora Clement, who played the women in this yeah. movie, the wives mm-hmm. are wonderfully cast. <laughs> yeah, That hypnotic perfect. kind of thing. Again, they are like that bullseye of that, I kind of it kind of doesn't even matter if what they're saying moves the story forward like their characters but it does it reveals character moves story forward but there's also just something hypnotic about them and it's yeah. almost trippy when you're watching that home movie cuz yeah. they look very similar and they end up being yeah. like for different reasons kind of like fulcrums of these men's lives in different yeah. ways and then there's a secret that they right. were continuing to speak to each other after Travis has abandoned them and I just again just, just putting my imagination cap on to be Nastasia Kinski and to know that I am a third act player. I'm one of those people who's talked about, yeah, not really shown very much. And then I have to show up and have a full life. That is not the life I'm trying to reveal to the lead character. And it wasn't written. So the week before you got there, <laughs> it was, I mean, it's just, she is just, I mean, the charisma was unbelievable. It was, she, it was you just, know, you know, so old she romantic. Wasn't, you know, old she wasn't, she made this movie. 21, 23, 22. She was 23 when it came out. Um, she was Tess in Roman Polanski's Tess, which came out when she was 18 wow. years old. And so I was like, Roman Polanski, oh shit. And the subject matter it was like, oh, it's actually, the rating is pretty low. She, it, it, Tess is about how a woman who falls in love with two men. She was like 17 when she filmed that movie. And then she was also in Paul Schaefer's Cat People when she was 21. So she's working with Polanski and Schaefer between the ages of 17 and 21. And then she steps into this movie and does this. And it's weird because if you do the A, you do the time, like obviously she's too young. It's, she's, she, it's like the Laura Dern in Jurassic Park thing. It's like it almost doesn't, you can't compute it, how young she is. But the wisdom, there is a fantastical element to this too. There is this like the death of youth, the two of them. And when you find out, I feel like there's a, it's like a, the way they said, the way that Trevor says they lived in a trailer, it's a, it's written to be like a, oh, like you picture this sexy relationship, this lovely, and then they're like, oh yeah, in the trailer. And it's like, oh, them, her, she's in a trailer. Like, you know what I mean? It's almost like, oh my God, like she's trapped in a trailer with this guy who can't hold down a job because he just wants to be in a trailer with her all day. Anyway, back, but to your point, I, I completely agree. But it also lets the other Anna, I think, is her name. The the um yeah, uh, Anne Henderson. Anne, was, I think was Anne his, uh, yeah. Um, Dean Stanton's wife. Sorry to refer to them as the their their, their partners, but Dean Stockwell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean Stockwell. Sorry. Um, she seems like the younger, more attractive version of him, if I dare say so myself. And so there, there's that added element of like you know maybe there's a little. Anyway, it's it's just it's very interesting the way that it played out. 
this is very interesting. It's amazing. This is the last comment I say, I, I promise, Dave. <laughs> there is a. Don't you come in here and lie to me? <laughs> really, there's something really magical when a story that is ultimately this pedestrian can be poetic. Yeah, and that might just be the the beauty and genius of them vendors because the pedestrian might be the best word for the storytelling and the performances. You kind of don't feel like there's anything really that special about what you're watching. These these issues are other than it's like somebody you know leaving and then coming back after four years of being gone, but like you, you know what that happens every fucking you know, day in around the world. Somebody walks out and comes hmm. back later. I mean, there's a there's still something very I, grounded about it. I realized it was it was poetry when uh, after, just after they watched the home movie, and he's just doing the dishes. Mm. And you see him pause mm -hmm. and you see this thought cross his face and it's, it's like he remembers. And then yeah. you see him put that away in a box that he can't reach. Not a word Ooh. is spoken. You just see this happen to this guy. Like it, it's yeah. like, that's a memory I don't want to deal with. That goes away. And yeah. he just, and he just becomes the person who doesn't remember anymore. It was spectacular to watch. Harry Dean Stanton's reaction shots during the eight millimeter home movie. Yeah. And then there's, you know, some of it, he would just couldn't even look at it. But then sometimes he would look up or look to his son and kind of smile. Mm. So it wasn't just one note. You know what I mean? There was this, you yeah. kind of kept wanting to be like, oh, that's how he feels about it. That's how he feels about it. But it was always, it was, it always, it was always okay to move forward. Like it yeah. kind of gave you this space for him to be like, I guess he is going to deal with this in some way, even though if this was a real Hollywood version of this. I think they would have raised the stakes way more on that. And he wouldn't have been able to watch it. He would have had to leave the room or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I can't look at this. He would have knocked over the projector or something. It just, it didn't, it never felt that, that melodramatic. No. In a beautiful too, way. Another thing too about the way that they shoot movies back in the day. Early on, he said, he goes, how long was I gone? And Travis and, and Dean Stockwell said, Stockwell, yeah. four years which we've, we've all known, but now he's talking. So now he's like, okay, he's slowly starting to reciprocate. And he goes, is four years a long time? Is four years a long time? <laughs> it is and to a little Wal boy. And then Walt what says, it is to yeah. a little boy. It's half, half his, his life. life. And Travis says, half a boy's life and reflects on that for a moment. And it's like, if you, you could easily just write it off and mm. say like, fuck it, idiot, weird guy, delusional and start trying to like put him into a box but then when he sees the whole movies it seems like he's like he, he can't possibly be a father to an eight-year-old but then very quickly it all comes back and it's almost like how can he pretend like he's not that I, I feel like i was getting that vibe from this movie as opposed to like i need to learn how to be a father mm -hmm. it was like how how can i escape the inevitability that i am and that she's his mom like that inevitability is what really gripped me i think if I had to pick, you just made me kind of realize not to put this movie in a box, but I think one of the strongest themes of this tale is what does it mean to to guide someone to the next step of their life? We have father figures, we have brothers, we have family dynamics helping pull people forward. You have the adoptive parent issue. You have the mother finally reuniting, realizing I have to be the mom. I know I'm supposed to be. I can't stay on the outside anymore. Um, that might be the. That might be it. And I, it's kind of one of those be beautiful things again, where like the the theme was so subtle throughout that you know if you don't, you're not going to be distracted by its indicative, in, mm. you know, notion throughout the entire movie. You kind of have to want to see that this is ultimately about a man confronting the fact that he is a part of a family, whether he likes it or not. And again, you might not agree with his ethics of like, but I'm not, it's not my job to be responsible for it at the end of this. I just need to get them all back together. But there's still something really beautiful about that. But Dave, back to your game. I promise we're winding this down, Dave, but when Hunter, they, this is hard to write for a kid. Hunter says, do you think he still loves her? Like dad and mom. He wants to know if his parents still love each other. Every kid wants to know that, right? People yep. you have divorced parents. If it, yeah. If... And Anne says, how would I know that, Hunter? And of course, Anne realizes he's lo she's losing her quote unquote son. You know, she, you know. Yeah. Hunter says, I think he does. How can you tell? Well, the way he looked at her. You mean the way he saw her in the movie? Yeah, but that's not her. What do you mean? 
that's only her in a movie a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But it's not. The kid can see something that's more than just a kid in a movie. While he's mm. making that Star Wars reference to the game that they were playing, Dave. Anyway, beautiful. I forget what I'm trying beautiful. to say with that, but like to write that. Ah, I wrote uh, the love thing came. You got to watch us on YouTube, people. Anyway, <laughs> ladies just, and gentlemen, Paris, Texas. It's a worth a watch. Slow cinema, but give it a shot. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All of us. Cheers. All of us get Cheers that. Cheers to Vin Vendors. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Nice. All right, well, fellas. Like, that. like I said, oh. if you're into cinematography, fucking watch this movie. Fucking yeah, dude. Mm. Mueller. Dave, I'm glad that you and you and Matt were the ones who were like, we should watch this. I was, I'd never heard of it, really, to be honest with you. And so I was glad that you two chose this movie. What a choice. Mm. All right, let's see if the clairvoyance is going to come our way. People, we are going to spin the random ear generator right now. Then do what you've been watching. Spinning it. Pause for a second. Tell you what the movie is. Dave is in a rush. <laughs> it's late here on the East Coast. 1960s. Oh. 1963. 63. I, can, oh. I actually don't think I can name a single movie that came out this year off yeah, the top of my head. We will I think we've done this. So. All right, we'll All right, tell you well, what movie we'll we're choosing about. very soon, people, but we have to get through what you've been watching, our final segment. Dave, we'd love to start with you. I know you've been sure. busy with work. What you've been watching? I've been watching Fallout, the video game adaptation yeah. on How Amazon it? Prime. It's fucking amazing. It is. Uh, like it if, you're, if you're a cool. fan of the video game, there is so much to see, but they've introduced so much sinister mythology underneath the sinister mythology that's already there uh if you're not a fan of the game there's enough story to keep you going and quirkiness and like weird things to entertain you um it's all around this is a winner um nice yeah nice dude fallout. i watched fallout very good i watched um for the first time i'm ashamed to say this breakfast club Ah, the first time movie. Oh my god! All the way through. That was one of those that just growing up in the age of cable in my childhood, I had seen like <laughs> bits and pieces of it quite a bit. Yeah, but I had never like rent the movie, watch it from beginning to end. I watched it on the plane. Pitch Perfect ruins it the ending. Very good. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Watch that. It was very good. And then I watched um, a little movie called Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah, really good. Late to the party, but I I really enjoyed that. You like you like and, some high um, drama on the plane. <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, hey, they worked well as as plane movies. Yeah, right. And then, um, yeah, that's all for now. I think I watched a few other things, but I forgot them. How about you, Jeff? By the way, we've talked about several movies from 1963. I can't wait to. I, I do. I know, know we we have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I really only watched one thing outside of this year. Well, one and a half. I started Ripley, and and I'm going to keep going. It's it's very slow at the beginning. This is the series on, I believe, Netflix with, um. Uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Scott Andrew Scott it's, it's sort of black and white it's about a, a guy who he's in crime he ends up being in, in a crime thing and, and it's Steve Salian wrote Steve directed Salian. yeah yeah so and, it's and I, Robert I, Elswit I, shot I, the whole thing I know I need to keep going but you it's, know with series yeah. I, I, I'm it's used the, to the I'm the used tel- to pilots the tele- Mr. Ripley series right yes yeah uh, yeah so I'm used to yeah. Pilots being like Mad Men and Breaking Bad, where the first episode is like whoa, and then it's and then it slows down, and it's still like, there's so many shows. Like I was like, do I watch Sugar? Do I watch Palm Royale? Do I watch? Um, I still haven't seen the DB Weiss and Dave Benioff. Like there's so many fucking things, and it's like I can't oh, I watch that. them all. <laughs> I watched Three Body Problems. You watched the whole thing? That's good. I did. I watched the whole thing. It was yeah. it was really fun. I enjoyed it. I love it. Full series comes down to one sentence. I love it. So it's like, I don't know what to do. So I started Ripley and, and I just need to keep going with it. But at first it was like, not what I was expecting. But then the Steve Martin documentary I finished. And it's just like, I, I, isn't that good? Isn't that great? I, the fucking hard thing again. I, I loved it. The first part and the second, the way they split it up and the way they split it in half. It's just it's so good, right? It's, it's hard. It's touching, not heartbreaking, but it's touching that second part. After the first part, it's it's way more For about sure. loneliness than I was expecting. But really Steve moving. Martin is what did that guy? It's, it's in the first part where he says, "I once asked this like club owner or whatever what it's like to talk to Steve Martin." He said, "It's like talking to nobody." <laughs> and I thought that was so interesting. They planted that seed at the beginning, and it's just like hard man to know. My only gripe with that, with the whole thing, and I think it's because I was a young person when I was getting, a, you know, watching all of my favorite Steve Martin movies as a kid, that other than the Three Amigos, 
he's America's dad to me in, in the movies. Yeah, well, and they kept talking about right? his movies bombing. And, and it's like, but he has that. like five movies that are huge. And that's all you really need is that I think they should have done that. It's like, I had a lot of movies that didn't work, a lot of movies that didn't work out. But yet, you know, you get um, two cheaper by the dozens. You get fucking um, Father, of the, Father Bride. of the Bride. You get, you know, anyway. Parenthood. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm glad you watched it, man. It's great. But you're right. They kept talking about how the movies were <clears throat> unsuccessful after the jerk. And it was like, come on. I know the Pink Panther is bad, but not Bullshit, all of them right? um, Okay, yeah. so people, we have talked about some of these movies. We'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second. Listen to some Docile, and we'll be back to tell you what we're going to be talking about next week. Let's go. we got to keep it under an hour and a half, Dave. Let's go. Nah, good luck. And we're back. Right. And we're back. And we're back. Okay, so I really thought Bye Bye Birdie was going to be the choice, guys. I really thought you were going to go for it. Or the four-hour Cleopatra that sunk a studio we were just talking about. We've already mm. talked about The Great Escape. Just because. <laughs> the Great Escape, which is also mentioned in a weird way in Masters of the Air. And To Kill a Mockingbird, we've also talked about as well. Vertigo mm. is up there on the list. The Birds is up there. But nope. Dave, you ended up making the tie-breaking vote in a way. What movie mm-hmm. are we doing next week? Oh, I've forgotten already. John? <laughs> High and Low by Kira- <laughs> Kurosawa. High and Low by Kurosawa. You can see this on Max or the Criterion. Get your Criterion subs up, people. The Max or Criterion. High and Low. We love Kurosawa, so get your Kurosawa fix in. We're going to talk about it next week and hopefully get some more mini-reviews in. Anything else before you want to say? Shit. Nope. <laughs> Can't even say Shit. what you wanted to say. Docile, stop poaching our... Come back. (laughs) Come back. (laughs) 